women across the state, just like you, have a significant contribution to make to public life. Your connections to community, your skills and your unique perspective mean you are rich with potential to be a great local councillor. The VLGA is here to connect you with the tools, the knowledge, the skills and the contacts that you need. I'm Deborah, the Women's Engagement and Project Officer at the Victorian Local Governance Association. I run our campaign called Local Women Leading Change, and I am excited to get started with our candidate development workshop. The Victorian Local Governance Association acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Victoria and recognises their continuing connection to land, waters and community. We pay our respects to the traditional custodians, their elders past, present and future, and to their cultures. When I present this workshop face to face, it usually goes for about two hours with a lot of time for interaction and questions. With our online format, it will be slightly different but we'll still maintain our interaction and question and answer format. Make sure you watch our Local Government 101 video. It gives some important background to the local government sector in Victoria and what it means to be a candidate and councillor. Once you've watched these videos, make sure you sign up for one of our Zoom workshops. They'll be led by me in groups of no more than 10 where you'll have a chance to answer all your burning questions. We'll also discuss some of the prompts that come up in these videos. So settle in, grab a pen and paper, or your chosen device, and enjoy. There are seven key steps that will help drive your campaign for local government election. We will go through them in a little bit more detail today, but here they are now. Step one, information gathering. Step two is profile and skills building. Step three, decide to run and announce it. Step four, campaign. Step five, nominate. Step six, get out the vote. Step seven, get elected. Before we get started with the details on how to develop your campaign and candidacy, let's take a look at the key dates for this year's election. The entitlement date is the date that you need to be living or paying rates in the council award in order to vote or run there. It's 57 days before the election, so the 28th of August 2020. The nominations open on the 17th of September. This is also the day that the voters' roll is finalised. Nominations close on the 22nd of September at midday, and then the ballot order is drawn. They are very strict with this, so you have to make sure that your nomination is in before midday and not a minute later. Your candidate statement, photo and candidate questionnaire are due on the 23rd of September at midday, but you may submit them when you nominate. Ballot packs will be mailed out from the 6th to the 8th of October 2020. Voters need to have signed and dated their postal votes by the 23rd of October at the close of business, and they need to be received by the VEC by the 30th of October at midday. After that, all results will be declared by the 6th of November. To be eligible to run as a candidate and serve as a councillor, you must be enrolled as a voter in the municipality, be an Australian citizen and over 18, live or own property within the municipality, and note you do not need to live or own property in the ward that you're running in, and you must have completed the prescribed training. You must not be an undischarged bankrupt, including property subject to control under the law relating to bankruptcy. You must not be disqualified for VCAT for gross misconduct as a counsellor, have had findings of two or more cases of serious misconduct in the preceding eight years as a counsellor, have been convicted of failing to lodge election donation return, have committed certain offences in the preceding eight years with penalties of at least 120 units or 12 month imprisonment, be disqualified from managing corporations under Part 2D.6 of the Corporations Act, be a serving councillor with another council, or be a sitting federal, state or territory MP. So now that the key dates have been covered and the criteria for eligibility, let's take a look at the seven steps for election. If you took part in Local Government 101, you already have some of the answers to the basic questions about your council and ward. It is worth putting all of this information into a one-pager, with more of a profile about the suburbs and towns you want to represent. Think landmarks, parks, shopping strips. 
Not only is it useful for you as the candidate, it will also be useful for your campaign team down the track. It is also time to take stock of your reasons for running. Take some time to reflect on why you want to run and what you want to achieve. You may have more than 10 things that you want to do, but when campaigning, it pays to be concise. Think about the best and worst leadership traits you have experienced and what traits you possess that would make you a good counsellor. What is one thing you'll do differently? What will you learn and achieve as a counsellor? Then you want to translate those reasons into a pitch for election. What are your key values? See page 23 of your campaign toolkit for a handy list of terms to describe your values. How will you put your values into action? The next step is to turn that information into your candidate statement. Write a first draft, circulate it to trusted friends for feedback, rewrite and keep polishing it until you are completely happy. Write a one pager for your campaign team about you as the candidate, including biographical details, your connection to the community and other things that you think are important. Keep it simple, concise and focused. This is our first activity for candidate development. Write a quick draft of a two minute speech. Think of it as a verbal version of your candidate statement. If you are not sure that you want to run or if you're supporting another woman to run or you would rather keep your cards close to your chest, this can be completely fictional. It is just an exercise in translating those values and goals for voters. Now is the time to be building your profile in the wider community. You may already have great connections with a range of different community groups. It's important to know how to leverage them for your campaign. Some people decide to announce that they are running months or even the year before an election. For others, it is something that they prefer to keep quiet until other candidates start to emerge. Whether you have already announced or whether you are planning to do so in a few months, you need to start a public social media profile. Before you announce your candidacy, you can just have your name as the name of the page and post about local issues, interesting news and important updates. After you announce your candidacy, you can also post about conversations that you have had with voters, policy ideas, initiatives and opportunities for change. Your real pitch. You may also want to start a website or at least have it developed, ready to hit publish when you announce. Connect with community networks. Be seen, heard and spoken about. Start with the networks that you are already connected to and talk to them about what they would like to see in their community. Test the waters. Ask your family and friends to connect you into their networks. From there, you can look for community networks that may be receptive to what you're putting forward and ask to meet with them. These might include groups like neighbourhood houses, sporting groups, friends of groups, t kindergartens, play groups, seniors groups, rotary clubs, the list goes on and on. It is all about being seen, heard and spoken about. You will never be able to speak to all the voters in your ward and that's even less likely if your council is unsubdivided. What you can do is make sure that the people of influence in your community, the leaders and the people who are well connected, are speaking about you in a positive way. Although they might not agree with you on every policy point or even commit to supporting you, do not underestimate the impact of one person of influence speaking to three people they know, saying something like, she really took the time to listen to my concerns or she will be a breath of fresh air on council. In terms of skills building, try to learn as much as you can about your council, including participating in council processes. Learn as much about the local government sector as you can. The VLGA runs events and provides information and forums that may be of interest. Get ideas from other councils and councillors. Think about what areas you might want to work on to assist your campaign. For example, public speaking or social media and seek out training on those areas. To be eligible to run, you must complete the training prescribed by the Minister for Local Government through the Local Government Act 2020 and this will be available through your council. Make sure you sign up to attend this once it is available from mid-July. Check out our website and your council website. Keep an open and curious mind and learn as much as you can. Do not feel that you need to be an expert on everything. You will continue to learn once you're elected and you'll have support to do so. Technically, you have until the close of nominations to decide to run, and that's the 22nd of September, 2020. 
You'll probably decide earlier so that you can hit the ground running. Tell your family and friends. Do you want to hold a small gathering to let them know and gather their support? Obviously, observe social distancing rules as you're doing that. Do you want to announce it publicly on your social media profile, which should hopefully have a following already, on your website, through a media release, and send it to local journos? Tell anyone and everyone you come across. I'm running! Once you have announced your candidacy, even if it's only to family and friends, you can build your team. It is crucial that you have a team around you, even if they have no local government experience. You cannot do this on your own. You do not need to have one person playing each of these roles. Play to your strengths and the strengths of those around you. One role that is crucial is a campaign manager. Depending on your relationship, that might be your partner or a good friend. It is important that you have someone to keep you accountable, but it's also to remind you that it's time to take a break or to delegate. Set your budget. Work out what you want to spend on your campaign before you start spending. What do you need to spend money on and what can you outsource to volunteers? There are so many different and creative ways to fundraise. Keep detailed records of any donations that you receive. You'll need them later, even if you're not successful, for your campaign election return. Here is an example of a shoestring campaign budget. You don't need to spend thousands of dollars to get elected. Prioritise conversations and meaningful connections, and the things that will help you get there. The nomination fee is non-negotiable, although you may get it back if you receive a certain percentage of the primary vote. Think about where you can reduce your costs. Do you know someone who is great at graphic design and willing to chip in a couple of hours for free? Is your son or daughter a budding amateur photographer who can take great photos for your campaign? You'll still need to declare these things as an in-kind contribution to your campaign, but it's a good way to save on the upfront cash purchases. Do you have a spare phone lying around that you can use for the duration of the campaign and just purchase a new SIM card and credit? There may be other things that you need to consider such as petrol or car hire for getting around. Some ideas for fundraising and keep in mind the COVID restrictions um, that may still be in place. Micro donations, so ask friends, family or colleagues for $10. This can easily be done online. Have a garage sale, it's a great chance to have a chat to your neighbours. Trivia night, ask for donated prizes and sell tickets. Raffles, again ask for donated prizes. You can hold a supper club, have friends over for dinner and charge them a ticket price. Start up a GoFundMe, have a barbecue and ask for donations there. Cocktail party, afternoon tea, have a movie night. That can be at home or it can be at a local cinema and sell tickets. Now this is really important, election donation returns. There's a $500 donation or gift disclosure threshold that applies to candidates and counsellors. It includes multiple donations from the same source and in-kind support. For example, if someone lends you a billboard or gives you free car rental, or if they help you design your website for free. Keep a record of all donations, no matter how large or small. You must submit a donation return within 40 days after election day, even if your donations are below the disclosure threshold, and even if you're not successful in your election. These returns are published after the election. The council CEO must ensure all donation returns are available on the council's website. The form and guidelines are available on the VEC website. Managing your time. Use the campaign timeline on pages 28 to 31 of your campaign toolkit to draft a rough plan of your campaign preparation and activities. Don't worry about the dates that are listed beside the things in the campaign timeline. Think more about the actual activities that you need to achieve. Will you take leave during the campaign period? Depending on your job, you may have to. Work out how you can balance candidacy, work, family and social commitments. At the start of each week, write a list of tasks you need to complete and work out what are the things that only you can do, like having conversations with voters as a candidate, and what can you delegate to others. And most importantly, delegate. You do not have to do everything yourself. Campaigning methods. There's direct voter contact, like door knocking and street stalls. There's media, like local newspapers and radio. Mail, like direct mail and unaddressed mail. 
social media like Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, and going to events, doing public speaking and public appearances. Make sure that you are enrolled and eligible to run by the 28th of August 2020. Make sure your loved ones and friends are all enrolled to vote by this date too, so that they can vote for you. Block out at least one business day between the 17th and 22nd of September to nominate. This has to be done by you in person at your local VEC office, which will pop up before the election period. Put aside the nomination fee, which is usually $250, and have your photo and candidate statement ready. You'll need a photo that is high quality and prints well in black and white, and have your candidate statement of up to 200 words that says why you are running and why people should vote for you. This is the one piece of material that every voter will receive, whether or not they read it. So this is your chance to get your message in for free. How to vote cards. Are you going to distribute a how to vote card? You could do this digitally or via social media, but make sure it is correctly authorised and approved by the VEC. Do you want to or do you need to meet with the other candidates to negotiate preferences? Whether you go for a how to vote card and whether you swap preferences with other candidates might depend on whether you're running in a single member ward that uses full preferential voting or whether you're running in a multi-member ward that uses proportional voting. Where your ward is determined by proportional voting, there's a lot more benefit to swapping preferences and providing a how to vote card. Make sure your family, friends and supporters have voted. Don't let them miss the deadline. Make sure that they are aware of your preferred pre preference order if you have one. And don't lose track of your own vote. You would hate to lose by one vote and know that that one was your own. Make sure yours gets mailed in ahead of time. Stay visible. Keep going to things, keep being out there, updating your social media, and then start to plan your election party. It doesn't have to be on election night, but you should organise something to thank your supporters. Not everyone gets elected the first time they run, and it is okay to be disappointed. People have been known to run five, six times before being elected. Take some time off and then evaluate your campaign. Stay involved and engaged with council advisory committees, lobbying on issues that you're passionate about, participate in the council budget process and other community engagement opportunities, and maybe if you feel ready in four years, run again. The COVID-19 pandemic has changed our lives in many ways. One of these will be how we campaign in local government elections. Some of the more traditional methods of campaigning are now inappropriate for our current context. Is it time to pivot? Online campaigning will be crucial. Letterboxing and mail may be the only physical campaigning you can do for the foreseeable future. Fundraising might be difficult, so what are some creative ways that you can do this? Keep messaging consistent and positive, or at least constructive. And remember to look after yourself and your team. Self-care is not negotiable, particularly in these times. Think about your own use of social media. What platform do you use the most? Think about the politicians or community leaders that you have come across on social media. Who does it best? What do they do well? What platform should you use? We wouldn't recommend Snapchat unless you were very familiar with the platform. Make sure you stick to friends and family and keep it appropriate. With LinkedIn, it's a professional and networking platform that can be useful in getting messages out if you have existing networks. It's unlikely to change votes, but it might connect you to supporters. Instagram is not a vote changer, but it's a way to document what you have been up to. So think of it as a visual diary. Facebook ads can automatically appear on Instagram too. Twitter can be a bit of an echo chamber, but it's a good way to connect with local journos and stakeholder groups. And then Facebook. To get started with Facebook, you need your own personal Facebook account. And then you need to create a public Facebook page. For example, Deborah Wu for Utopia Ward or Deborah Wu for Best City Council. You'll need a few high quality photos, a headshot and then some extra out and about photos. You'll need a campaign email address for people to contact you on and maybe a campaign phone number. 
this shouldn't be your normal mobile phone number. If you're going for a campaign phone number, this is where you should get an extra SIM. And then you'll need a short biography for your about section. Here are some examples of women counselors and their profiles on social media. You'll see that there's some great photos of them out and about in the community, often performing their counselor role, and some photos of the community itself, recognizable landmarks, different things that will help you to identify their place in the community. You can start a profile before you announce your candidacy. If you're not ready to announce it yet, the name of the page can just be your name or your name, community advocate or activist. Before you announce, you can post photos of community events that you go to, local businesses you frequent, relevant or timely issues, events that are coming up in the community, or interesting local news. After you announce, you can do all of those things, plus the conversations that you've had with voters that bring up important issues, policy ideas, initiatives, and opportunities for change. Here we have some posts from women councillors about events that they've been to, with local sporting groups and community groups, going to events that are about a topical issue and making sure that you tag in lots of organizations that are relevant. And that's a great way to increase the exposure and reach of your posts. We've also got some examples of women counselors going to schools and community groups. Make sure that when you're posting photos of children that you either have permission to show their faces or you're taking photos of the backs of their heads. Now, my personal favorite is this one from Kat Bennett at Wodonga City Council, and it just ticks all the boxes for social media because she's got a cute constituent, a topical issue, and some great graphic content. Plus, she's tagging in a bunch of different groups as well. You don't even need to be generating your own content. You can be sharing things that are relevant, like this post from Megan Bridger Darling and the Footscray Historical Society. All she's done is share it, but it's topical and it's relevant and interesting to people in her community. Here's another post from Kat Bennett, where all she's done is share another interesting and topical idea from Warrnambool City Council. So taking ideas from other councils and councillors and sharing them. And obviously this one's going to get a lot of likes because or comments because it's about pineapples and whether they belong on pizza. Facebook advertising is cheap and easy. Make sure you're targeting your voters. Only ever pay for advertising that is specifically targeted to the audience that you want to reach. And that means that if you're running in Melbourne, you don't want people in Western Australia or Tasmania to be seeing your posts. And how can you get free organic exposure instead of paying for ads? Tag people or organizations in and get people to share your content. The best thing that you can do is to post something that people will want to share with their networks and then you have free advertising right there. Use Facebook's resources. They have lots of tips and tricks on how to use their tools. And keep it visually appealing. With minimal text, try to tell a story through the image. Be responsive, proactive and listen. Be genuine, your authentic self. Post lots of photos, document what you've been up to in the community and illustrate your life and your vision for the community. Share ideas for council and share your views about issues that come up. You need to know what you, are, what you are and are not willing to share. What is private and what is fair game? So for example, your kids, do you want to show their faces on your social media page? Get free organic exposure where you can. And have a clear policy. It doesn't need to be more than two paragraphs for usage. So what is and is not allowed? What behavior will you tolerate and you know accept as reasonable? And what will you not condone? And do not feed the trolls, get into online fights. It's never worth it despite the adrenaline rush. Do not promise things that you cannot deliver and do not tell fibs, see above. And don't share information without making sure it is from a reputable source or verifying that information. Do not post blocks of text. If you have a lot to say, post it on your website and then link to that with a short summary on social media. Don't forget to be human. 
And don't forget your duty of care to yourself and the people involved in your campaign. You can always turn off and log out. Thank you for participating in the VLGA's Local Women Leading Change Candidate Development Program. For more information about any of the topics that we have discussed in this video, make sure you go to the VLGA website at vlga.org.au. On there you will find fact sheets, media releases, and most importantly, your campaign toolkit, which is the resource we have designed just for you to help you take the leap into local government. Remember to sign up for a workshop, like our Facebook pages, Victorian Local Governance Association and Local Women Leading Change. Feel free to send me an email at deborah at vlga.org.au if you have any questions. See you soon.